Hello, how are you today? I often hear those words at the store from cashiers standing at the cash register. In this lesson, we will begin exploring the use of registers in digital design with a broad overview. First, a distinction needs to be made between memory and storage. There is some confusion here because these terms are often used similarly in common English parlance, but in computers, they mean different things. Memory is for short-term data access. Storage is for long-term data access. Memory is accessed more quickly than storage. Memory is volatile, which means that it is cleared whenever power is disconnected. The older technology here is called static RAM, which is made up of flip-flops. As we discussed in previous videos, flip-flops need to have continuous voltage supplied in order to hold a logic value. Storage, on the other hand, is non-volatile. It maintains its values even if power is disconnected. A few of the many storage technologies are listed here. Solid state drives like a USB stick are newer, faster, and more expensive. Hard drives include examples like CDs and DVDs, as well as reels of magnetic tape. These technologies are older and slower, but still commonly used. Because of these differences, memory and storage are used for related but different operations. Memory records things that change quickly, such as typing a document or watching a video. Storage records things that change more slowly or are permanent, such as saving large files or loading an operating system. When you are writing a report for this class, you click the Save button on your word processor. This is the point where memory is transferred into storage. Memory lets you see the most recent words you typed, but if power is disconnected, those words are lost. Clicking the Save button takes a little extra time to move that information into non-volatile storage. Another fun example of transferring data in the other direction is loading a level on a video game. I may be dating myself here a bit, but I spent a significant amount of time with this first edition PlayStation back in middle school. I remember that in a game, if I kept playing the same level over and over again, it would load very quickly. However, if I moved on to a new level, it would take a long time and I would hear the disc spinning inside of the machine. Why was that? The information for the new level needed to be transferred from storage into memory. All the data is there on the disc, but the disc needed to be spun around to the correct location and then scanned into the temporary memory. Why move it to temporary memory at all? Because the RAM, or random access memory, can update quickly, which lets the game run without noticeable lag. In your later computer architecture classes, you will study much more the relationship between storage and memory. In this class, our focus is on memory, which we implement with registers. What are registers? Registers are sequential circuits, which means past values help determine current values. Registers are composed of flip-flops, at least for static RAM, that are tied to a common clock. By common, I mean they are connected to the same clock signal. Registers are used for data memory and or data movement. Because of this, they are fundamental units of complex circuits. When you think of a digital register, think of a cache register. Sometimes cache is taken out of it. Sometimes cache is put into it. Sometimes the drawer is closed and the cache is held there for a while. Hmm, this sounds a lot like enabling or disabling a circuit. More on that later. You might be thinking that we have used memory before, especially in the Mealy and Moore machines. You are correct. At a fundamental level, those circuits are the same as the ones we are about to look at. The big difference with registers is that we conceptualize them as a unit. An 8-bit register does contain eight distinct binary cells. 
each of these cells holds either a zero or one and is made as a single flip-flop. You could do things like access only bit number four. However, all eight bits are usually modified together. Maybe you download all eight bits at once. Maybe you clear all eight bits at once. As such, they are held within a single device. Contrast this with the flip-flops in our Mealy or More design examples. For those, we thought of each flip-flop individually, which is why we developed separate Boolean equations to control each flip-flop. What good is holding data in a register if we can't access it? That is where the concept of register transfer comes in. Register transfer simply means transferring data into or out of registers in a controlled fashion. A useful example for illustration is shown here. At the bottom is our memory, or a series of registers that have known addresses. Register 1 holds 0101, register 2 holds 1000, and so on. At the top is our processor, which contains temporary registers and an ALU. ALU is short for Arithmetic Logic Unit. It is a combinational circuit that can do a variety of operations depending on what mode it is placed in. Think of this as a calculator. These temporary registers serve as the inputs to and output from the ALU. So, let's say we want to add two four-bit numbers together. The processor needs to do four things. First, it identifies the augend. This number 0011 is found in memory, transferred to the data bus, and then into this temporary register. It will sit there for a few clock cycles. Second, it identifies the augend in a similar fashion. This number 1000 is found in memory, here at register address 2, transferred to the data bus, and then into this temporary register. Third, it selects the operation for the ALU, which in this case is addition. Immediately, because the ALU is a combinational circuit, the sum 1011 is produced. Fourth, this information needs to be sent somewhere. Maybe it gets displayed on the computer monitor. Maybe it causes a sound on the speakers. But in this example, it will be written back into RAM. So, the processor identifies a memory address, sends the sum down the data bus, and then writes it into memory. That sum could then be accessed as an input for the next operation. Those are a lot of steps for a simple addition. The system's processor is what controls all of this. In the coming lessons, you will get a chance to act as the processor, flipping switches at the appropriate times. You will also get a chance to build control circuitry that does it automatically. The glue that holds all of this together is the system clock which synchronizes the changes in all these different registers. This last slide summarizes some of the common register operations. All of these are combinations of serial or parallel movement of data. Serial means that bits move in a single file down one channel. Parallel means that bits move simultaneously down multiple channels. This is illustrated nicely in these top two examples. For a serial in, serial out register, the bits will move one cell to the right on each clock pulse. So this one would be here next, and then here. For a parallel in, parallel out register, these cells do not communicate with each other. One data source passes in this one at the same time as a different data source passes in this zero. We could also mix these operations. For example, we could use one clock cycle to load in all four of these bits in parallel, then use four clock cycles to send out each of these bits individually in serial. Just the opposite is true for this bottom example. The rotate operation is only a slight tweak on the serial register. Here we take the output bit and feed that back around as the input bit. With all these different operations, which we may want to employ at different times, it is useful to have multifunctional registers 
with a mode select used to determine the behavior. In the coming lessons, we will see examples of building these register functions individually and also combined into a universal register. And then we'll use them for some common applications.